We have an announcement to make to you all. It's good news. We have many projects for visual politic in the pipeline, starting with a new collaboration with Value School, a Spanish non-profit organization that has the goal of expanding financial culture through a range of tools, documentaries, audio recordings for radio and podcasts, books, courses, and more. I'll leave the link to their website here. It's currently in Spanish, but soon it will be in English. Well, in collaboration with them, we will prepare a special weekly video that allows us to immerse ourselves fully in the world of finance. And to begin with, we propose an idea. Have you ever thought about what could happen if we brought together the brightest minds from the mathematical and the financial world in the same project? A project which makes use of complex mathematical calculations and advanced software that is able to model reality and therefore know where, how, and when to invest. Do you think something like this is even possible? What if I told you that this experiment has already been carried out and that it gave rise to the largest hedge fund on the planet? Do you want to know what happened? How far does the power of prediction really go? This is the story of long-term capital management, a gigantic hedge fund led by some of the world's brightest minds that in 1998 came close to sparking a huge slump in the financial markets. You may have never even heard of this fund, but in early 1998, it was one of the most coveted jewels in the world of finance, a role model to follow. Despite this, just a few months later, in September 1998, this same fund came close to collapsing global finance. Through a sophisticated financial engineering system a month before it collapsed, long-term capital management, with just over $4 billion in equity, had managed to control assets of more than $120 billion, all thanks to enormous leverage and all kinds of complex financial operations. In total, we're talking about more than 60,000 transactions recorded on the balance sheet, 80% were G7 country bonds, and the remaining ones were stocks. However, the most impressive thing was its off-balance sheet operations through all kinds of financial derivatives, futures, swaps, and options. To give you an idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about here, according to the report jointly prepared by the SEC, the Federal Reserve, the US Treasury Department, and the Futures Commission, the notional value, defined as the value of the assets behind the derivatives contracts traded by this fund, amounted to $500 billion in foreign exchange futures, $750 billion in swaps, and a another $150 billion in options and other derivatives. Exorbitant figures that made this fund the largest hedge fund in history. However, on Wednesday, September 23rd, 1998, the Federal Reserve urgently had to launch a large-scale rescue operation so that the bankruptcy of this fund, known until then as the Rolls-Royce of hedge funds, would not cause a real earthquake in global finance. Now, what exactly did this company do? What is a hedge fund? What happened to make everything fall like a house of cards in 1998? Let's begin. The best of the best. Long-term capital management was founded in 1994 by John Merriweather, a former executive at Salomon Brothers, one of Wall Street's most historic investment banks. But do you remember the question I asked you at the beginning of this video about bringing together some of the brightest minds in mathematics and the financial world for the same project? Well, that is exactly what John Merriweather did. Create something like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen in the financial world. LTCM united the beautiful people from quantitative investment in an attractive new hedge fund. Gregory Millman, 1995. We're talking about characters such as former Federal Reserve Vice President David Mullins, Eric Rosenfeld, a former Harvard professor, and future Nobel Economics laureates Robert Merton and Myron Scholes, authors of the popular Black Scholes model, a model used to value options that is studied in all economics and business faculties around the world. <laughs> And we should point out that Robert Merton and Myron Scholes not only acted as partners and consultants for the project, but were also directly responsible for designing, implementing, and evaluating both the valuation algorithms and the complex computer software that traders used on a daily basis in order to decide what trading they should do. In this way, you could say that long-term capital management tried to implement that old dream of uniting academic knowledge with the practical experience of the markets. This goal was to model reality using complex econometric formulas to be able to find the best investment and neutralize any risk. 
thanks to this approach, they were able to secure just over $2 billion from very high level investors. To give you an idea, the minimum subscription was $10 million. But having said that, what exactly was this fund? What was it investing in? Let's answer these questions. But I think first of all, we need to clear up just exactly what a hedge fund is, don't you? Well, it's not easy to define what is and what isn't a hedge fund. Let's say they are instruments similar to investment funds, but usually aimed at professional investors and are subject to very scant regulation. They virtually lack any limitation on how to trade. A hedge fund aims to try to maximize its profitability through financial engineering, different levels of leverage, and the intensive use of financial derivative. Yes, I think that pretty much describes it. Well, we'll see more in detail anyway in an upcoming video here on Visual Politic. But okay, let's move on. Long-term capital was basically to be a hedge fund in the style known as long-short. Let me explain. It was looking for correlated assets, in this case, mainly bonds, that would historically have been related in a certain way, and which for different temporal reasons had an anomalous relationship. In this way, the hedge fund opened long positions, i.e. invested in relatively cheaper bonds, and at the same time, they were short-selling relatively more expensive bonds, venturing that over time, it would return to its starting relation. For example, one of the most important operations was to buy German bonds with a maturity of 30 years and simultaneously short-sell German bonds for 10 years. Why? Because their models had determined that, at the time, the spread between the two types of bonds was extraordinarily high. But look, when we talk about an abnormal differential, we may be talking about very, very small differences. In fact, in most trades, margins were minuscule, and so doing many trades and maintaining very high leverage was essential for increasing profits. But for us to better understand the effect of leverage in a simplified way, take a look at this. That could be the balance sheet of a hedge fund like this. Remember that equity is the resources provided by investors. The rest are liabilities, debts, and repayment commitments. The fact is that this means that there are many more resources working to generate profits on the contributed capital. The problem, however, is that the margins are so small that if an adverse scenario occurs, then this capital may not be enough to bear the losses. And then there is an asset hole, and the company goes bankrupt. But we'll talk about that later. By the way, remember this point for later on. Another big gamble of this hedge fund was to invest in Spanish and Italian bonds against German bonds, thinking that the advent of the euro would lead to a convergence in the yield offered by the bonds of these countries. So at this point, the question we need to ask is, how did they do this with this strategy? What were the early days of long-term capital management like? To what extent did all of these econometric techniques manage to tame the market? Okay, let's take a look. From the days of wine and roses to the storm. The truth is that these first few years were good, very good, better than good even, spectacular. To give you an idea, the net profitability of commissions and management costs of long-term capital management was 42.8% in 1995, 40.8% in 1996, and even 17.1% in 1997, at the outbreak of the Asian crisis that we will also talk about in depth here on Visual Politic. And that's not all. In 1997, Robert Merton and Myron Scholes, two of the firm's partners, and as we have already mentioned, those responsible for the algorithms used to decide investments, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. So you can already imagine how by early 1998, this fund was one of the great stars on Wall Street. Algorithms, formulas, software, computers, long-term capital management was a revolution. The icon of a new era of unlimited profits and no risk. After all, if algorithms were able to predict market trends and efficiently calculate the movements that were going to occur, what could possibly go wrong? However, these algorithms had one essential flaw. They assumed that the market was fully rational and that past events could efficiently predict future ones. And that flaw was something that in 1998 was going to become painfully clear. As it is often the case in markets, something which no one expected happened. The crisis that broke out in 1997, when Asian economies collapsed, continued to have repercussions. And to top it off, in August 1998, Russia, affected by its bad economic situation, devalued the ruble and defaulted. That is, it suspended payment of its sovereign debt. And that, that caused a tsunami in the markets. Suddenly, there was a whole stampede towards safer markets and products such as US government debt. 
In this way, the money began to flood out and everything seemed to be at risk. This meant that liquidity in financial markets evaporated and spreads as well as risk premiums in companies and the most troubled countries skyrocketed. So in this situation, this particular hedge fund took a huge hit. For example, long-term capital management was committed to some convergence between the yield on US bonds and emerging market bonds because they had statistically determined that the spread between the two types of debt was very high. In that way, as we've seen before, they invested in emerging country debt while selling short US debt. Well, after the Russian default, what happened was that that differential increased even more. And the same thing happened with the stock markets. Similarly, the spread between the US government bonds paid and bonds from solvent companies had never moved more than two or three points in two days, but it suddenly moved 21 points on August 21st. What LTCM's risk models judged practically impossible occurred less than five years after the founding of this hedge fund. That move alone resulted in losses of several hundred million dollars. And do you remember the bonds of the European countries that we mentioned before? And where long-term capital was committed to its convergence? Well, quite the opposite happened there as well. The risk premium of countries such as Spain or Italy compared to Germany also increased. The world was experiencing the exact opposite scenario as outlined in the strategy of this fund. Fear and current events proved too much for the algorithms and statistical records. And so, this is how LTCM's collapse occurred. The fall of geniuses. After the Russian default, things went from bad to worse. By mid-September, the fund had already lost more than 40% of its capital. A situation that had two immediate consequences. On one hand, the fund's leverage soared further. Of course, the same liability to much lower capital caused leverage to soar. And on the other hand, the fall in their positions forced them to provide more guarantees. But there was a problem. They didn't have enough capital. And their investors weren't willing to put in any more money. The castle was beginning to teeter very badly. And that's how we arrive at the moment before the rescue. Look at this. The abrupt and disorderly closure of LTCM's positions poses unacceptable risks to the U.S. economy. Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1998. To avoid such a scenario, the Federal Reserve coordinated the Rescue for Long-Term Capital Management, a bailout that was carried out in practice by the world's leading investment banks. Entities such as Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and the Union of Swiss Banks, among others, had to disperse more than $4 billion to stabilize the situation. The great project of bringing together the brightest minds to model markets through algorithms and computer systems came to an end. The thesis of market efficiency and statistical predictability clashed with reality. There you have it. This is the surprising story of long-term capital management. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Also this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. If you want to learn more about politics and world affairs and hear some more of my lovely voice, come check out the Reconsider podcast, where we don't do the thinking for you. Find Reconsider at www.reconsidermedia.com or on Apple or Google Play or your favorite podcatcher.